Before we begin our study this evening, we need to make sure that we are ready to study the Word, which means that we're in fellowship. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for this uh, opportunity that we have this evening to study your Word. Your Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. The psalmist said that it is in thy light that we see light, which informs us that the ultimate foundation of all truth is a special revelation, that which you have revealed in the Scriptures, that which you have given through the apostles and the prophets. Father, we pray that as we study your Word that you would help us to understand what you have revealed, that we may be able to uh, exchange the human viewpoint in our soul for a divine viewpoint, that we may learn to think about the creation as you have created it, and thereby come to a greater understanding of your plans and purposes for mankind. Now, Father, we pray you'd help us to understand these things we t- study this evening. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. We're continuing our study in uh, Genesis, and we are in the first chapter of Genesis still, working our way through the six days of restoration. Now, we have to have a framework for understanding these uh, this first section in Genesis, which is from Genesis 1-1 through Genesis 2-3. To do that, we start with the first part, the introductory section, where we learn in Genesis 1-1 that in the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. At this point, all that this is saying, and we'll get into this a little more later, and, I, and, and at some point I don't... Th- I don't think we can be quite as dogmatic on this as we can on some other things, but we have to deal with the certain clues that are in the Scripture. God creates the heavens and the earth. This is the space-time continuum, which I have described by this dark circle that you can barely see on the overhead, but you can kind of make it out. That dark circle describes the boundaries of the universe, just the space-time continuum. In that, all that we can discern from Genesis 1-1 is that there is a planet, Earth. Now, we want to read back into that and say, well, there were stars, because when we think of a universe in this universe, we think of a universe with stars. I will show you why I do not think there were stars in existence then uh, as we come to the fourth day of creation uh, this evening. There's the planet. The planet comes under judgment. The original Earth was probably the throne of God uh, and the headquarters of the angels, specifically Lucifer. All of that is simply deduction from what we have in Isaiah 14 and Ezekiel 28. Lucifer, the uh, son of the dawn, bright morning star, uh, Hillel ben Shahar in the Hebrew, rebels against God. That is described specifically under the five I wills in Isaiah 14 and the dynamics of it in Ezekiel 28. God then judges the universe, at which time there is darkness. Darkness, as I said last time, darkness is the absence of light. It is not something that is created. God in the future new heavens and new earth, it, it's all light. There, there is The light emanates from his glory. There's no need for sun, moon, or stars. And so the absence of all light in the universe indicates some element of judgment, The earth is tohu vabohu, and then there is a restoration. Genesis, the six days of creation are actually six days of recreation or restoration where there is a completely new heavens and new earth as opposed to what had existed in the original heavens and earth in Genesis 1-1. That is what is the the details of, that that is what is covered in the details of Genesis chapter chapter 1. The stars do not come into existence until the fourth day. Now, the earth is said to be two things, tohu and bohu. The tohu indicates that it is chaotic and unformed. And in the first three days, what we see is God forming the different spheres. He, he forms the uh, the universe as a whole. You have the development of light, separation of light from darkness you, on day one. And on day one through three, he forms these various spheres. He will form the atmosphere, the hydrosphere, and the biosphere, the geosphere. And then in the second half, the bohu section, he fills these, each of these spheres with their uh, proper uh, inhabitants. 
So day one we looked at last time where God creates light, separates light from darkness, and this is temporal separation. Then on day two, God creates the atmosphere called the rakia, and he puts this rakia, poorly translated firmament. It doesn't have the idea of something solid, whereas the English word firmament had that idea solid, so people had this idea that, well, the Bible just isn't isn't correct here. Uh, I think last week when uh, Tim Lipsy was here from Brazil, we were discussing this, and he said that was true even in the Portuguese Bible. So this apparently this idea of firmness was uh, something that was picked up and used in different languages, but that's not a correct understanding of the Hebrew rakia. So there is the atmosphere that is uh, the gaseous atmosphere that is perfectly balanced with the proper gases necessary to sustain life on planet Earth, oxygen, nitrogen, hydrogen, helium, and the various other uh, trace elements. You have a separation of the waters into an upper level of water and a lower level of water so that the upper level, which we're not sure, I don't think anybody can be certain what it is. There have been various scientific models proposed and studied from ice crystals to water vapor to a solid layer of water, uh, different different uh, suggestions have been made, but we don't know what that upper level, how that actually existed. We can I think, conclude or infer certain things uh, about it scientifically. So there is also there is this spatial separation that occurs. And then on day three, where we concluded last time, God uh, separates the waters on the earth. To this point, the entire earth has been covered in water. And then he separates the seas and creates boundaries for the seas, uh, brings out the dry land, puts... Um, and vegetation comes forth from the dry land, and so we have this geographic uh, separation. So, as we, as I stated last time, what happens on day one is that the Holy Spirit begins to hover over the earth. He energizes uh, the, the water there and begins to put energy into the earth. Here, God energizes the earth and moves the earth up out of the water. God generates various chemical reactions that are necessary to precipitate all of the very solid material. Remember, this time all the earth and everything just in suspension in the water. And so God generates certain actions to precipitate those solids out of the water. And the material then uh, formed would tend to arrange itself isostatically. That means that heavier materials would sink, lighter materials would float or move towards the top. There would be tremendous earth movements in response to this rapid heat, in response to this, and there would be rapid heating and cooling of the elements taking place. So it's a very dynamic process taking place during this time. We can't go back and, and recover whatever the, the laws were, because these are the laws of creation, not the ongoing laws of physics. So you can't go back and recreate this in the laboratory, figure out how it was done. It is done by the voice of God and his creative power. So day three, you have an initial statement. Then God said, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place and let the dry land appear. Now I want you to notice something. In day one, you have one statement of creation. Day two, you have two, you have one statement of creation. But then on day three, there are two statements of creation. I want you to observe how carefully the text is constructed here. On day three, you have God said in verse nine, let the waters below the heavens be gathered into one place. And then in verse 11, you have a second statement from God, let the earth sprout vegetation. So there are two creative activities on the third day. You have the same pattern on day 4, 5, and 6. Day 4 is one act of creation. Day 5 is one act of creation. Then when you come to day day 6, there are two acts of creation. So there is a perfect balance here in the text. This isn't something that's just haphazardly thrown together, there is a very precise order in the original uh, text, and we have to take that into consideration. In the second uh, part of the third day, there's the creation of the plant uh, biosphere. God says in verse 11, Then God said, Let the earth sprout vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees, bearing fruit after their kind, with seed in them on the earth, and it was so. 
So we have the command in verse 11, and then in verse 12 we read, And the earth brought forth vegetation, plants yielding seed, after their kind, and trees bearing fruit with seed in them, after their kind, and God saw that it was good. You have the command in verse 11, and the reality of the command, the execution of the command, in verse 12. Let's look at a couple of important components of this, of the breakdown in this particular passage. You have two orders of plant life mentioned. It appears in the English, you have three orders, vegetation, plants yielding seed, and fruit trees. Actually, what you have, is a, uh, it should be translated this way, let the earth bring forth vegetation, colon. Two types of vegetation, plants yielding seed, uh, the first word is just generic term for vegetation. It is the Hebrew word desa. The Hebrew word desa, which means just, it, I mean, just that. It's just a, a basic term, or de- desha, just a basic term for vegetation. D E S H E. Just a basic term for vegetation that is then broken down into two components. It's broken down into two components. The first is called eshev, or actually esev, E-S-E-B. It's a soft B, almost a V. And the second is trees, ets. We transliterate that E-T-Z. Esev is just a general term for plants, ets, for trees. Between the two, they cover every category of vegetation. What we have to understand is that the Bible is not written according to modern systems of taxonomy. Therefore, it's not going to come along and break things down the same way modern science breaks things down. The plants and trees, this is not a technical taxonomic uh, breakdown. We'll see the same thing in this verse when it comes to the mention of the term kind. The term kind and in the Hebrew does not refer, uh, mincha does not refer to what we would consider to be species. We're not sure where the biblical kind breaks down, somewhere between what we would call species and genus, which is the next level up. Somewhere in between there is the, the boundaries and definition of the, of the uh, Hebrew concept, uh, Genesis 1 concept, of, of kind. So God says, let the earth bring forth vegetation, colon, to, and then he lists the two kinds of, or the two broad categories of vegetation, plants yielding seed and fruit trees bearing fruit. Now I want you to notice that when God creates the vegetation, he creates within each category of vegetation their own reproductive system. Inside that reproductive system you have Two things. You have the basic physical uh, components, the basic physical chemicals that make up each individual category. And then on that, that cell structure is imprinted information. Now, cells cannot generate information. Information has to be inputted from an external source. You can go out and you can buy yourself a computer. And that computer is not going to auto-load Microsoft Word or Microsoft Office or WordPerfect or any other program. The information has to be put on the computer first before it will utilize and process the information correctly. So God not only creates the all the different categories of, of plants and trees, but he creates a reproductive system unique to each and then inputs the information necessary for each kind so that it reproduces itself. Now, there's a couple of implications here that I want you to understand. First of all, up to this point, when God does something, he's categorizing things. He he creates the light, and he separated it from the darkness, and then he called the light day and the darkness he called night. That's categorization. And he is, he is categorizing and classifying everything. Now, I pointed out last time that categorization and classification are necessary for language to function. Not only is it necessary for language to function, it's necessary for thought and knowledge to be transferred. If, if you understand categorization and classification, it's a mysterious 
phenomena how the brain begins to do this from day one. If you've had the experience of watching your little child from infancy, you can point out to that child when he sees a dog, you point out this is a puppy dog. That's a kitty cat. And and perhaps the dog that he sees is a uh, a Yorkshire Terrier, and the cat that he sees is a is a uh, little tabby cat. And then the next day you go to the zoo, and he sees a a, a, a Saint Bernard and a lion. And yet his brain has managed to classify, and he's looking at that lion and those lion cubs like a cat, and he can distinguish between cats and dogs. And his brain is already categorizing and classifying according to these kinds. Now, if these kinds were fluid, that has incredible implications for, for knowledge and learning. So this whole area of how the brain uh, processes information and learns information all stems from the fact that God has created man a certain way. He's created the creation a certain way so that we are able to process, categorize, and classify information. This is one of the reasons why we break down doctrines into various categories. This is how we learn. This is how we learn anything. You categorize and classify, and then you come back and you can synthesize after that and put the information together. But first you have, to, you have to separate and divide, classify and categorize, and then you can come back and synthesize. And that is the entire process of learning. And you constantly go back between those two activities of categorization, classification, division, and then uh, synthesis. And we might just summarize that into analysis and then synthesis. So we see this from the very beginning that God is creating everything according to specific uh, categories and uh, classification and all of this uh, it continues it, it's stable so that uh, a, when you are instructing your child as to what a dog is tomorrow when he wakes up a dog is still a dog it hasn't become a cat if you apply evolution in terms of the implications for language and learning then language cannot be stable because your categories can't be stable and words can mean whatever anybody might want them to mean oh that's postmodernism that's exactly why, what, where, how you get postmodern thought out of an evolutionary basis is because your starting point is in a realm of pure uh, guesswork and, and uh, relativism. So the Bible continues to maintain the same system of classification and categorization, and the permanence of these kinds is brought forth uh, later on in the scriptures. For example, in 1 Corinthians 15:38. It says, God gives it a body just as he wished, and to each of the seeds a body of its own, indicating each has a corporeal body. All flesh is not the same flesh. There are categories of flesh. But there is one flesh of men and another flesh of beasts and another flesh of birds and another of fish. So even the New Testament comes along and insists that there are definite, unbreakable boundaries between the kinds. Uh, in the Old Testament, you have this uh, stated again as a foundation for uh, categorizations of clean and unclean animals. I'm just going to read you a few verses from the overhead, Leviticus 11:13 and following. It goes on. There's about 10 or 15 verses like this, but I'll just give you a taste of it and read these first uh, four. These, moreover, you shall detest among the birds. That's a classification of unclean animals. They are abhorrent not to be eaten, the eagle and the vulture and the buzzard and the kite and the falcon in its kind, every raven in its kind, and the ostrich and the owl and the seagull and the hawk in its kind. So this uh, continues to be a categorization that is accepted and goes on throughout the, the Scripture. This is based on the Hebrew word mina. Mina, M-I-N-A-H, for uh, kind. As I said, don't confuse kind, the biblical kind, with species. They're not synonymous. There are uh, clearly some overlaps, and we don't exactly know where the kinds break down, but it's somewhere between what we would call genus and species. Then at the conclusion of these, of day three, we're told it was evening and there was morning a third, a, a third day. Once again, emphasizing it's a 24-hour period. Conclusion of verse 12. I'm backing up. 
Uh, conclusion of verse 12, and God saw that it was good. This is the Hebrew word tov. Now, what you will find is you will have some people come along, and they will say, you, look at the word good, and they will impl- give an implication here of moral quality, it, good as opposed to evil. And the word tov has as its primary meaning that which is according to plan. It can mean good versus evil. Now, if you go through this, as we should all be familiar, you go through the six days of creation, and each day God says that it was good. Then when he finishes, he says it's very good. You'll still have people come along and say, see, it's very good, moral quality, everything is good, there's no sin here. So therefore, Satan couldn't have fallen yet. Well, the, the uh, premise is false, and the false premise is that good in any of these verses has a moral quality to it. It doesn't have a moral quality to it. It only has the idea that God is a blueprint, as it were. Let's say you're an architect, and you have a blueprint, and you go out and you build a house. And each day you check the house to see if it's being built according to specifications. And if there haven't been any mistakes made during the day, and if everything is done according to plan, then you say, okay, it's good. It's exactly what was called for in the plans. The next day you check it at the end of the day. Everything's according to plan. When the house is finished, you say it's complete. It's all done according to plan. Now, why would I say that good here, how can I prove that good here doesn't have a moral quality to it? Easy. In chapter 2, God uses the word tov once again. Now, if it's got a moral quality here, it would have to have a moral quality there because in the place that he's going to use it in chapter 2 is also related to, the, to creation. And in chapter 2, after God creates Adam, he says it is not good for man to be what? To be alone. So here he uses the same word tov again, and he says it's not according to plan. If he's saying it's not moral for man to be alone... If that word tov has a moral connotation, then God would be saying it's not moral to be single. Now, of course, we know that's an absurd statement. So, obviously, the word does not have a moral quality in the context of creation. So, you can't go to the word good here and say, well, sin hasn't occurred yet, the fall hasn't occurred yet, or or Lucifer's fall hasn't occurred yet. Uh, That doesn't hold water. So sometimes you'll find people try to argue against a gap between Genesis 1-1 and 1-2 on the basis of the word tov. Okay, we've completed the uh, first three days of uh, creation. Now we come to the fourth day where we start to fill those areas that were, those spheres that were created on days 1 through 3. So on day 1, God separated the light from the darkness And now on day four, in parallel to that, he is going to create the light bearers, that is the sun, the moon, and the stars. I want you to notice that this is a strong argument against these days being any longer than 24-hour days because God creates the vegetation on day three, and for that vegetation to survive, it needs photosynthesis. And in order for there to be photosynthesis, uh, there has to be the sun and uh, available light and in near proximity. So this is one indication that these days can't be millions of years or lengthy ages. Okay, let's look at the breakdown on day four. Genesis 1.14. Then God said, Elohim said, Let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night, and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years, and let them be for lights in the expanse, that is the rakia of the heavens, to give light on the earth, and it was so. So in verses 14 and 15, we have a statement of the divine command. God, the word light that we found back on the first day is the Hebrew word or. The Hebrew word or, which looks like this, we have an aleph, Resh, with a holom or holom vav in the middle, and that would be transliterated simply O-R. Then when we have <clears throat> come to this verse, in verse 14, we have the word ma'or, and that is transliterated M-A-O-R. Or is the word for light, and ma'or is the Hebrew for a light bearer. Up to this point, light has just been there non-specifically in the universe. It hasn't been localized in a specific specific body. But on the fourth day, God localizes the light and, and 
to specific light bodies or receptacles, which in turn generate light. So in essence, what he does is he is he creates the energy systems in the various stars. Remember, our sun in our solar system is just like any other star in the universe. And so what God does to one, I think God does to all of them. So we have the statement, let there be lights in the expanse of the heavens to separate the day from the night. Notice these are related to separation, categorization, classification. Separate the day from the night and let them be for signs and for seasons and for days and years. Now, when this says for signs, it's not talking about the zodiac. It's not talking about astrological signs. You would be amazed at how many people try to do that. I think my voice is rough tonight. I didn't have one yesterday. Um, this clearly, though, would, would uh, I mean, not in the sense of astrology, and you'd be amazed. There are actually some Christians over the years, B- Bullinger was one that comes to mind, who tries to uh, substantiate this idea of the gospel in the stars. And you will maybe see a book on that here or there where it tries to show that that you have a, a nonverbal story of the gospel in the heavens. You have Leo, Leo, the lion for Christ, who is the lion of Judah. You have Virgo, the virgin for the Virgin Mary. And you have the northern cross and the southern cross. And So you can see that there's a certain element related to the zodiac signs that you could make, uh, you could bring over and try to assign a gospel meaning to, but that sort of an assigning the meaning after the fact. I don't know of anyone who could, who has ever uh, discerned the gospel per se by just looking at the uh, signs of the zodiac. You'd have to know the gospel first, and then you might be able to figure it out. So I think that that is just, um, frankly, a waste of time to try to make make that work. Uh, you can make it work, but it's only because it's an after-the-fact decision. It's sort of like figuring out an Agatha Christie murder mystery because you read the last chapter first. So that's uh, don't waste your time on trying to figure out the gospel according to the stars. But God establishes them for signs and for seasons and for days and for years. And the grammatical construction here is that all of these are, are related to each other, that, that the purpose for the, the heavens is to be able to tell the different times of the year for planting, for harvest, for, um, for winter, for summer, different, and for telling time. So they are set up in the, in the heavens uh, in order to have chronology. And they are there to give light on the earth, and it was so. Then in verse 16 we read, and God made, and the Hebrew word here for made is asa. This is your generic term for creation, to make or to manufacture or even to do. And God made the two great lights, the greater light to govern the day, that would be the sun, and the lesser light to govern the night, that would be the moon. Now the moon doesn't generate its own light, but we're talking the language that's used here is phenomenological language. Phenomenological language is language that we use all the time. We talk about what time did the sun come up this morning? Well, you and I both know the sun didn't come up. Neither does it go down. The earth rotates on its axis, but we talk phenomenologically. It looks like it rises. It looks like it goes down, and we talk use this phenomenological language to describe what it appears to be from our vantage point. This is the same idea that you have back in verse 14 where it says, let there be lights in the rakia of the heavens. Now, that rakia, as I pointed out last time, is used in the scripture to describe all three categories of heaven, the the, uh, atmospheric heavens, the solar heavens of the universe, as well as the heaven of heavens, God's throne room. So the lights in the expanse of the heaven is spoken of phenomenologically from the viewpoint of the earth, that they look as if they're up there in the atmosphere, just above the atmosphere. In verse 16, the uh, uh, when we look at the moon, it looks like the moon generates light. It's not making a scientific statement. Uh, it is used, though, it does reflect light and uh, upon the earth and is used for telling time, for chronology signs, the tides, and various things of that nature. So God made the two lights, the greater light to govern the day and the lesser light to govern the night. He made the stars also. Actually, the verb is not repeated in the last clause, 
what you have in the Hebrew is just the statement, and the stars also, so that in that phrase it picks up the main verb of the previous clause, and so it is correct to insert it here because it's going back to the verb asa, to make. Now this has raised several major questions about the universe based on the fact that the stars aren't created until day four. One issue is what about the distance that light travels? Light travels 186,000, was it 186,000 miles per second in a vacuum? And so you have the problem of light years and the transmission of light because what do you do with a, with a sun that is 200 or, or 2,000 light years away and the light, how long it would take 2,000 uh, years of light travel before it hit, came to the earth and wouldn't that be a, a problem? Well, there are several possible answers. First of all, the easiest solution is just that when God created the stars, he made the light instantly appear on the earth as well. I mean, if God can create stars, he can create their, their, their light travel so that it hits the earth instantly. But then you have people who will raise other questions. For example, what happens if today we see a, a star nova? And that star is, shall we say, 10,000 light years away. Well, that means that if that star that we see nova today it actually occurred 10,000 light years ago. So there we have various chronological problems. Now, there are various answers that are proposed, and, of course, a lot of work needs to be done on uh, working through these solutions. The trouble is that creation scientists don't get federal grants, and so they have to work in their basements and in their garages on their own money in order to put together any kinds of experiments to work through things. They don't have the uh, National Institute of Science helping them out and funding their projects. So there are um, various things that are suggested, and according to uh, Henry Morris's book, The Genesis Record, he makes the following statement. This may constitute a minor problem, but there are several possible answers. The tremendous stellar distances commonly cited are obtained only on the basis of a number of very esoteric and questionable assumptions. Geometric methods for measuring such astronomical distances can reach only to about 330 light years. So any great distances beyond that are, to say the least, uncertain. Furthermore, there is no assurance of the uniformity of the speed of light at such tremendous distances. There's nothing to indicate that that light travels that distance uh, throughout the universe. Furthermore, he states, there exist respectable models of relativity and space curvature, uh, for example, which yield light motion such that light would reach the Earth even from infinite distances in only a few years. So what he's saying there is there, there is no... There's evidence that light may travel, uh, may not travel in a straight line in space. What that means, let me see if I can diagram this for you without, I know some of you look like you're about to go to sleep. I don't want to bore you with the science here. If planet Earth is here and you have a star out here and light is traveling from that star to the Earth and let's say it takes 5,000 light years uh, measurement, that is assuming what science assumes is that that traveled in a straight line. However, there's evidence to suggest that light doesn't travel in a straight line, and it may travel in an arc. I mean, that's one possible solution. So if, if it's 5,000 light years from point X to the Earth, and it's traveling in an arc, then it's actually much, much closer. So that is one, uh, one hypothesis that is uh, being studied. So there are various ways to resolve that particular problem. Furthermore, when God creates the stars, you have another instance here, and that is that does this is he is God just making the stars reappear? For example, just as it were, he turned the lights off back in Genesis 1:2, when darkness was on the face of the earth, there were stars already there, and he just turns the lights off, and now he's turning the lights back on. That's possible, but that really doesn't fit the concept of Asa here. Asa indicates creation. Every other place, he's, God's making something new. There, he's not making anything new. He's just sort of turning the lights on. 
Now, my suggestion is that this is, in this present universe, the existence of the sun, the moon, and the stars is unique to God's plan and purposes for this particular universe. And I base that on what the way things are going to be at the end in the new heavens and new earth. Revelation 21, 23 through 26 gives us a glimpse of the different physics of that future new heavens and new earth. And the city we read there, that's the New Jerusalem. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine upon it, for the glory of God has illumined it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nation shall walk by its light, and the kings of the earth shall bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, for there shall be no night there, its gates shall never be closed, and they shall bring the glory and the honor of the nations into it. The implication is there's no sun, there's no moon, there are no stars in the future new heavens and new earth. So we have to be careful. When we read that word heavens, we want to import into that the starry skies. But the new heavens and new earth apparently aren't going to have starry skies. You're not going to have beautiful full moons, so enjoy them now while you have a chance. You're not going to have dramatic sunsets because there won't be a sun, so enjoy them now and take your pictures while you have a chance. Because at some time, they're not going to be there. So what I'm saying is that on the model that I have proposed for understanding Genesis 1, 1, and 1, 2, is that the original creation did not have sun, moon, or stars either. Whatever the spatial dynamics were in terms of the heavens, uh, we don't know. God has not seen fit to give us all of that uh, information. So on the fourth day, God creates the uh, light bearers, the sun, the moon and the stars, and fills up the, the heavens. Then on day five, or, or that is tantamount to what he does on day one in creation of the light and separating the light from the darkness. Then on day five, on day five we have the creation of the birds of the sky and the uh, cr creatures, the living creatures in the waters. Remember, on day two, God created the rakia, the atmosphere, which he placed between the upper and the lower waters. Now he's going to put creatures in the atmosphere and creatures in the water on day five. So we see this perfect parallelism. Then God said, verse 20, Let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures, and let birds fly above the earth in open expanse of the heavens. Verse 21, And God created the great sea monsters and every living creature that moves with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. So in verse 20, we have the articulation of the command that God is, let it, is commanding these creatures into existence. And then in verse 21, we have the, ap, uh, the, the application, the fulfillment of that command. God creates, and in verse 21, it adds a category that was not stated in verse 20. And that is, in verse 20, it just said, living creatures in the waters and birds in the heavens. In verse 21, we have the great sea monsters. Well, what are these great sea monsters? Well, first of all, let's look at our categorization. In verse 20, we're told, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. This is the Hebrew word, sheretz. Elsewhere, we find in this chapter the Hebrew word remesh, and this is creeping things or living creatures. This has to do with everything from, from, uh, from the uh, microscopic to the large creature, everything that's in the waters, from, from plankton all the way up to, to animals. Uh, let the waters teem with swarms of living creatures. Let birds fly above the earth in the open expanse of heavens. Then God creates the great sea Monsters. Now, this word that is translated sea monsters is the Hebrew word tanin, T-A-N-N-I-N, tanin, the great, the great sea monsters. Now, this word was a word that has been translated dragon, sea monsters, and is a term that could very easily include large dinosaurs. You know, that's the question that everybody comes up with is, well, if God created everything in six days, or if God, all the animals went on the ark, what about the dinosaurs? When did dinosaurs live? Well, it's very easy to see that this, uh, class, this classification of the Tanin could include 
uh, dinosaurs and would, would picture that. It, it, remember, you go back in human history, you don't go back very far, and you have stories, legends in, in England of St. George fighting the dragon, and you have various, uh, all kinds of legends in various cultures from South America to Africa to Asia of people fighting dragons. And if you look at dragons and then you look at, at dinosaurs, there's not just a whole lot of difference. Furthermore, you do have a passage in Scripture that seems to fit the description of a of a dinosaur type creature in Job chapter 40 uh, verse 4 or verse uh, 15 let me enlarge this can y'all read that I need to bump that up a little bit um, behold behemoth which I made as well as you now here's a description of behemoth first of all he eats grass like an ox so he is a vegetarian Incidentally, God is the one speaking here. Behold, now he says, his strength in his loins and his power in the muscles of his belly. So this is a creature that has extremely powerful legs and extremely powerful muscles in his body. Next, he says, he bends his tail like a cedar. He bends his tail like a cedar. Now, what animal has a tail like a cedar? Like a huge tail. Well, some people talk about you talk about the behemoth. They'll say, well, it could be an elephant or a hippopotamus. Think about the kind of tail that an elephant or a hippopotamus has. That just a tiny little tail. So it wouldn't be a tail like a cedar. The sinews of his thighs are knit together. His bones are tubes of bronze. His limbs are like bars of iron. He is the first of the ways of God. And let his maker bring near his sword. So that certainly seems to indicate something, uh, uh, some sort of powerful, dangerous aspect of the, this creature. So this particular creature mentioned in Job 40:17 is a creature that is uh, could easily be classified as some sort of, of uh, Diplosaurus or or some other category of of, uh, of dinosaur. So the assumption that man could not live alongside of dinosaurs assumes a number of things. First of all, you're assuming that they live in the same, uh, the same area. Well, human beings don't live alongside of, of lions and tigers and other uh, beasts very easily either. So just because we have uh, uh, from... from um, we have lions and, and tigers living doesn't mean that they have to exist in the same arena, in the same geographical location as man. Neither does would it mean that dinosaurs had to live in the same area as human beings. So all I, the only argument I'm making here is in day five, the Tynin could easily include these great uh, creatures referred to as both sea monsters and dragons. God created the sea monsters and every living creature that moves, every living creature that moves. That it means there's nothing uh, left out. Uh, everything with which the water swarmed after their kind and every winged bird after its kind. And God saw that it was good. Once again, it's not a moral designation. It is simply a designation that everything fits according to his blueprint. And God then blesses them. And this is another important verse to observe. God blessed them saying, be fruitful and multiply and fill this, the waters and the seas and let birds multiply on the earth. There are four verbs here that are all cal imperatives. Uh, cal stem is just your basic declarative verb stem in the, in the Hebrew. And the imperative mood, of course, means that this is a command. So God expects these creatures to follow his orders. He has, like with the... the um, the pl plants and the trees, given them a reproductive system. He has put the information into the, their reproductive system so that they can multiply after their kind. And he commands them to be fruitful and multiply, to fill the waters, and, and to let the birds multiply on the earth. This is a real command. We must understand that this is a command that goes into effect prior to the fall. Now, I'm building a case here, so don't let me lose you. Genesis 1.23, then there was evening, there was morning, a fifth day. Now we come to the sixth day when God creates the land creatures. God establishes the land creatures. Verse 24, 
Then God said, Let the earth bring forth living creatures after their kind, cattle and creeping things, and beasts of the earth after their kind, and it was so. We have three classifications of land animals here. The first is uh, cattle, which is probably domestic animals. Cattle would be a term that would just categorize all domestic animals, not just not just cows, not just beef cattle, but would include sheep and all categories of do, uh, of domestic animals. Creeping things. This would include uh, everything from uh, lizards to to uh, to bugs and 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 uh, insects, all other things. And then uh, beasts of the earth would include the un the non domestic animals. This would be the wild animals. Now that's an important thing to notice here because later on we're going to, in chapter 2 we're going to discover that, that God brings the beasts of the field to Adam to name. And some people say, well how could Adam name all of the animals in one day? But God doesn't bring the beasts of the earth to Adam to name. He brings the beasts of the field to and which is a much smaller classification. Beasts of the field is different from beasts of the earth. Beasts of the field would be your domestic and uh, your domestic domesticatable animals. He brings the beasts of the earth after their... So they, they come, and each one is after its kind. So there are clear breakdowns, classifications of all of the animals. Verse 25, God made the beasts of the earth after their kind, and the cattle after their kind, and everything that creeps on the ground after its kind. And God saw that it was good. And this is the end of the first activity of day six. Remember I said day one has one creative activity, day two has one, day three had two. Day four has one, day five has one, and day six has two. So the first creative activity on day six is the creation of the land animals, both domestic and non-domestic. And then in verse 26, we're going to get into the creation of man both because of my voice and because this is a section I want to take in its entirety. I don't want to split this up. We will wait until next time before we get into our study of the creation of man, at which time we're going to come back. And I want you to remember that God made a, gave a command to be fruitful and multiply to the animals. He will make the same command to man. If that has reality to the animals, it must also have the same reality to man. And I'm going to leave you with that thought until we come back next time with our heads bowed and our eyes closed. Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We thank you for revealing to us the precision with which you have created all things, the order, the categories of classification. Father, we pray that you would help us to appreciate all that you have done in creating the heavens and the earth as they are. We pray this now in Christ's name. Amen.